Jaguar reached out, delicately feeling over the building before him. Quite a discreet system. I'd be willing to bet she doesn't even know it's there. Probably her father's work. With a quiet chuckle, he coaxed the system into the digital equivalent of a coma, and then slipped inside. He had to admire her taste in residency, though, as he prowled silently through the hallways. It was a bit old-fashioned for his taste. He preferred the luxuries of modern technology. But there was a certain refined yet comfortable feel to the simple nature of the place. It didn't take him long to find her. The Jaguar believed in many things, but chief among them was preparation. With enough preparation, even the worst of ill luck can be circumvented. In this case, though, the blueprints he'd overlaid onto his vision were hardly necessary. The place was quite small, and her door was clearly labeled with a polite little brass plaque reading, Amy Morel. He paused for a moment to rearrange his appearance. A tidy uniform of classic police blue appeared, along with a crop of short brown hair and a neatly trimmed beard. A few personal tweaks, adding a scar here, a small stain there, extending the nose a bit, and then he stepped up and knocked firmly on the door. There was a brief delay, with a muffled voice saying, I was just about to head over, no need to get... The door opened a crack, revealing a lovely face framed with rich gold curls. Oh, excuse me, officer, I thought you were... Can I help you? He politely doffed his cap and gave her his most neutral, business-like smile. Sorry for intruding like this, ma'am, but I'm afraid we don't have much time. You see... I'm running late for the performance, I know, she interrupted apologetically, and I'm sure they told you to escort me there, but I'll be... It's not that, ma'am, he said hurriedly. He'd built plenty of time into his plan, but the police would be on their way any minute, depending on how quickly they saw through his little game. It seems you are in danger. I've been sent to escort you to a safe location. She stared at him blankly. In danger? He couldn't help but feel amused by her complete bewilderment, but he let nothing show on his face. From what? We have a strong evidence that a criminal known as the Jaguar is coming to kidnap you, he told her gravely, watching with satisfaction as her eyes widened with shock. There's no need to worry, ma'am. We were informed well in advance, and we should be able to catch him. But to be on the safe side, we're going to move you to a more secure location. Now, if you'll come with me, please. Uh, hold, hold on just a minute. I have to grab a few things. Just leave it! He snapped, but instantly leveled out. Look, I'm sorry, ma'am, but we have to go now. He could be coming any minute. <sighs> Fine, she said crossly and disappeared from the door. She appeared again a moment later with a tablet clenched in one hand and stepped outside. She glanced anxiously down the hall both directions, of expecting a mad jaguar to leap around the corner, wildly waving a bloody chainsaw in both hands. Uh, should we take the back route or something, to avoid detection? The jaguar pretended to consider this, smiling inwardly. No, I'm sure he knows about any back entrances. In fact, he's more likely to take a back way than a front. With that, he led her down the corridor towards the exit. It was fascinating watching her, really. She followed his every footstep, glancing nervously over her shoulder every now and then, but never once questioning his authority or decisions. She's probably never been in a real serious situation in her life. Pampered by a big bad daddy while young, a priceless star protected by her people when grown. She wouldn't last ten minutes in a prison, or in the slums. She had a certain morbid appeal for him, a purity and innocence one didn't encounter much in the criminal scene but he couldn't help but feel a trace of contempt for her meek acceptance. As they made their way out into the busy street, he turned to her and spoke quietly. We're not going to run unless I tell you to run. He's an experienced hacker, and he probably has any camera on the street rigged to notify him if you try and flee. Just stay behind me, act like nothing's wrong. If I tell you to run, we run. She gave him a very serious nod, and they plunged into the crowd. Being a policeman has its advantages, he reflected, as the crowd parted before him avoiding his gaze. Something about being near policemen just made people feel guilty. Except maybe the people who really were guilty, but it wasn't very often they would be caught near policemen anyway. He felt a tug at one of his sensors and discreetly glanced behind him. Two men, one short, hook-nosed, and gray-haired, the other easily half a head taller than himself, with gleaming black hair, both with surveillance glasses. Hide-and-seek's done, then. How do you feel about tag? He turned and whispered to Amy, Run time. With that, they both lunged forward and sped into the crowd. He spotted us. Our units move in quick. Remember, no gunfire unless you absolutely have to. We don't want the riot, and we definitely do not want Amy harmed in any way. Francois was not in the best of shape for chases, but fortunately neither party was making particularly rapid headway. 
Crowds with tricky race courses at the best of times, and these were hardly the best of times. He was quickly developing a respect for the sheer size of his partner, though, who plowed through the crowd like a row of turnips, leaving behind a wake that made his own passage fairly easy. He kept a wary eye on the two fleeing in front of him via camera monitors feeding into his glasses. He was, unfortunately, too short to see over any but the smallest aliens and humans, but the cameras were always conveniently perched at high altitudes. The girl had clearly been duped by the uniform, but it would take more than a clever disguise to get the jaguar out of the net that was quickly closing in around him. At the edge of one of the cameras, a line of policemen were working their way through the crowd. The girl probably couldn't see them, but the jaguar clearly did, peeling off towards an alley on the side of the street. A feeling of dread crept over Francois as he noticed a grin on the man's face. Quickly, he pulled up a street plan, looking to see where the alleyway went, but as far as he could see, it was a dead end, with no access to either building. Still, it was with some urgency that he pointed out the alley to Edouard, who immediately shifted course. It was painfully slow going, but he knew the jaguar couldn't be going much faster. Still, it was a relief when the dark mouth of the alley finally pulled up in front of him. Peering into the darkness ahead, he could loosely make out the two figures. He also saw when the jaguar turned to him, grinned, slipped a hand around Amy's waist, and leapt up almost fifty feet to the nearest roof and vanished out of sight. I think he might have gotten some physical enhancements done, observed Edouard dryly, earning him a withering glare. If I sigh any more, my mouth is going to get stuck this way, he thought, sighing. Gerard, we're going to need to have us. He's on the roof. They sent me to get you because I've had some improvements done, he explained to Amy, who was now clinging to his back. He was running far faster than any normal human could, although an alien like an Elgin might have. Not that Earth police would ever let an Elgin into their ranks. Honestly, he could have gone a fair bit faster, but he was trying to slow down enough that the hovercraft pursuing him would at least catch a glimpse. He didn't have to wait long as a hovercraft suddenly rose from below roof level in front of him. He could feel Amy's grip tighten with fear. <laughs> a bit closer than I'd hoped. At least they're looking for a capture, not a kill. He made a quick gauge of his current power levels, then reached out and scrambled the computerized aiming on their stun guns as he made a flying leap over the vehicle, feeling the air around him sizzle as beams of energy missed him by fractions. Their aim should be back in a minute or two, but that's all I need. With a thundering crash that left dents in the floor, he landed on an open platform in a seaside construction site. Moving carefully so as not to accidentally knock Amy's head into a low-hanging beam, he wove his way down to the bottom of the construction site, hearing the police hovercraft surrounding the building. At the bottom, he knelt and let Amy stiffly release him and hop to the ground. Rumming her neck, she fixed him with an accusing stare. That was a police vehicle that was firing at us, and I thought the police didn't allow physical mods. He rummaged through a pile of support bars and cables as he spoke. He stole a military cruiser. You think getting a police hover would make him blink? But you're right, I'm not exactly police. We'll have time to talk about that later, though. At the bottom of the heap, he found what he was looking for, a small metal switch. A quick click and a section of the floor split open, revealing a short ladder leading into a two-person vehicle set on rails that vanished into blackness. He gave a brief bow to Amy, gesturing towards the hole, and then followed her into the vehicle below. As the hatch sealed the path behind them, and a dull glow came on to illuminate the distinctly featureless transport, the Jaguar sent out a single digital communication. Up above, the skeletal framework of the building-to-be erupted into a mass of flames and sank into its bare metal knees, hiding any trace of their passage. The muffled shockwave rattled the world around them, causing Amy to shoot a fearful glance at the ceiling, and then to turn to him with an expression of careful evaluation. He ignored her, reaching out a hand and pressing the lone red button square in the middle of the otherwise barren panel in front of them, and they sped away into the looming darkness. <laughs>